إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا خالدين فيها لا يبغون عنها حولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, And we're almost at the, the tail end of this project with Surat Al-Kahf uh, Many of you remember that I was doing the Surat Yusuf series uh, you know, more than a year it took to complete that series, and then I wanted to finish up what I left off with Surah Al-Kahf. And Alhamdulillah, we're we're almost there, uh, even though every ayah is a is a major challenge by itself. So, as I was studying for this ayah, I decided to use this as an opportunity to just give a glimpse of this kind of thing uh, on open social media platforms. Also, uh, we are now looking at ayah number one hundred and eight, and in this ayah, Allah is going to talk to us about Jannah. There are two ayat, 107 and 108. Both of them are dedicated to life in heaven. Uh, so for those of you that are listening and are not Muslim or are not very familiar with Islamic terminology, Jannah is our term for heaven. It's the, the Arabic word Jannah comes from Jim Noon and Noon. The origin refers to something well covered. Uh, and Janine is the womb of the mother. And the jinn is the creature that cannot be seen. It's covered or veiled from the eyes. And Jannah is a garden that is covered in greenery perfection of a garden is called Jannah. So in the previous ayah that I've already discussed yesterday, Allah says, those, of you who, those, those that have believed and have good de- done good deeds, they have the gardens of Al-Firdaus, the highest level. The highest level garden or the most perfect of all gardens is called Al-Firdaus. And the Prophet ﷺ invited us to ask, ask us to, if we're going to ask Allah for anything, ask for the highest Jannah, Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. So, and Allah then added something that He usually doesn't add, you know, in many places in the Quran, only some places Allah has hinted at this reality. And that's a reality that I wanted to focus on today, picking up from where I left off yesterday. He didn't just say they're going to get Jannah. He said they're going to get Jannah as Nuzulan. Now, Nuzulan is, uh, you know, Adhiyafa lin Nazil. This is the hospitality shown to somebody who comes over. So, let me tie all of this together in simple English for you. Like, once you go over to somebody's house and the moment they arrive, there's a welcome. There's you open the door for them, you greet them. And as soon as they sit down, you offer them, can I get you something? Or you give them some peanuts, chips, whatever you give them, candy. It's not the main course meal for which they arrived, but there's some introductory hospitality and greetings. That portion of the hospitality where you're just giving that that introductory, you know, a welcome, that's called nuzul. And Allah says the highest levels of Jannah are being given as Nuzul. Which is remarkable that if that's the introduction, then what more is there, right? What more, so there's, there's got to be something more to it for that to be described as Nuzul. Now Imam al-Alusi rahimahullah says, well Allah doesn't necessarily mean that this is Nuzul and there's nothing more. Let's look at a few things that are possible. One possibility is that the excitement that comes with Nuzul, the first moment of being received, the first moment of anticipating the great main course about to come. That anticipation is actually a remarkable kind of excitement. And let's pause without talking about Jannah for a moment, about our own emotional state, our psychology. We are most excited about things that are about to happen. Things we're looking forward to, that are on the verge of happening, those are the things that excite us. So for example, Eid is around the corner, it gets exciting. The kids know that dad's coming home with some presents. It's exciting. The, the, the moment, the initial moment of receiving the present or the surprise, that's exciting. We're about to land in a place that we've been wanting to go see forever. Somebody finally reaches Mecca. It's super exciting. So excitement is actually tied very closely to anticipation. Like something's on the verge of happening and it excites you. Or the, the initial impact of something, the initial phase of something is super exciting. Right. And if you, you know, you can't maintain that level of excitement throughout constantly. It's there, then it tapers off. And there may be other moments of excitement, but that early excitement, that that anticipation, it goes away over time and then other pleasures take its place. Now, one implication of this could be that what Allah said in the beginning of the surah, ma kithina fihi abada, He said that they're going to remain in anticipation forever. In other words, Jannah is never going to be a place where I'm not looking forward to something coming. 
because I'm so used to it, it always happens. You see, in this world, if you're a an extremely wealthy person and you have the most beautiful home in the most beautiful location, you look outside, you're on top of a cliff, you can oversee the ocean, you see the sunset from your, your mansion. People only dream of that kind of a residence, right? So if people come there for the first time, they can't stop looking outside the window. They can't help but stare at the sunset. They're just lost in how beautiful this place is. But the owner... He's actually got his back to the window. He's not, it's not a big deal for him. Why? Because that's an everyday phenomenon now. There are people that have never traveled on an airplane before, right? You should see the kids that have gotten on a plane for the first time, or even adults for that matter, going on a plane for the first time. It's an event for them. And then you should see people that travel on planes all the time. It's adab for them, <laughs> right? And there are people, man, you get to travel on a plane? Whoa, that's like, it's such an incredible thing, right? So what I'm trying to get at, it, it doesn't matter what you've accomplished in this life. It, the initial exposure to it can be really exciting. You getting your job, the first day you got your job is super exciting. The, the, the first day you got to university is super exciting. But you can't hold on to those excitements and they cannot be renewed over and over again. The next semester is starting, you're like, I can't wait, more and more midterms. Nobody does that. That's not our, that's, you know, I can't wait for next year. We have another five projects that I'm going to have to do overtime for. Nobody's thinking that way, right? The, the anticipation, the excitement wears off. Whether it's a new car, whether it's a new home, whether it's a job, whether it's another experience, all of those boil down to excitement or anticipation wearing off, weaning off. Allah says here, that Firdaus will be given as Nuzul, which creates a problem, it's a temporary problem at least. Well, if it's Nuzul, where there's anticipation, eventually what happens to that anticipation? It wears off. And what does Allah add? He adds in the very next ayah so beautifully after a little bit of break, because there's a break, even though grammatically it's all one sentence, Khalidin is hal from the Damir inside Alladina Amanu, or even inside Kanat Lahum, it's, a, it's, a, it's continuing describing the state. Allah says, Khalidina fiha, they will remain permanently in it. Now, what is it that they're remaining permanently in? They're remaining permanently in heaven, but they're also remaining permanently in heaven as it occurs as Nuzul. So the anticipation, which is impossible to retain in this life, is made permanent by Allah in the next life. So a person who's married. Every time they see their spouse is like they're seeing their spouse for the first time. It's the first day of their marriage every single time. Every time they're eating something, like your favorite kind of chicken, your favorite kind of fruit or whatever, every time you're biting into it or even you're looking at it, you're amazed that it's like the first time you're about to have it. In other words, in this life, the world outside can be beautiful. But the way you feel about it on the inside can actually start to rust. Right? The, 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 the car is still beautiful, the mansion is still beautiful, the, the food is still delicious, but the excitement and the anticipation and all of that stuff that you felt inside that made that amazing, that made you want to eventually have it, and you worked so hard to earn the money to get it. But that excitement will start waning off. What does Allah do in Jannah? First of all, the outside cannot even com be compared to the outside, the virtual or the near heaven experiences we try to create in this world. You can't compare it. But more importantly, what goes on inside you is going to be made permanent. The feeling of excitement, the mukth, that the, the hospitality feeling that you get with nuzul has been made eternal. Khalidina fiha. That's an incredible, incredible thing. But then we get into a new kind of tension. Like, okay, so Allah has described something that we really can't imagine in this world because we cannot imagine being excited every single time. You know, like imagine like if you love sports. You know, recently I got back into cricket. You know, or basketball, ping pong, cricket, whatever, right? If you never miss a shot, if you never miss a shot, if every every time you hit, it's a six. If every shot, every three-pointer you take goes in, you know, every, every time it's perfect. Eventually, you're like, this isn't challenging. Excitement comes from change. Excitement comes from nearly not getting to where we were going to get to, and then we accomplished anyway. That's what makes a game exciting, isn't it? In other words, Allah has created excitement and anticipation in this world associated with the threat of failure and loss. It's actually because there were 400 people that applied to that job, and then you got that job, that makes it so much more exciting. 
if nobody else cared for that job and you got that job and it's the same pay, same exact job, it's not as exciting. It's simply not as exciting. When you got first place in the class, there's an excitement because there was a sense of competition. If there's nobody else enrolled in the class and you got first place, <laughs> there's no, okay, well, you know, first place. There, there's no sense of excitement associated because there was no challenge. There was no, 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 no tension, no friction, right? So that's yet another you know, dimension of Jannah that we can't process. Why? Because we only think of exciting, you know, joy bringing accomplishments when they happen after overcoming some levels of adversity. If the things that are so easy to acquire actually don't bring us that much joy. Like even as children, we don't get as much pleasure out of the toys that we do have. But the ones that we have to beg and cry and get good grades and eventually our dad will get, get us that one. That's the one that's exciting. And even that one, once you have it, after a couple of days, that toy won't be exciting. It's another one that you don't have and you have to overcome some obstacles to get to it. That's what makes it exciting. Kids play video games. What makes a video game exciting? The adversity in the video game, the boss that you can't beat, the level that you can't complete. That's what makes the video game exciting. Well, that's what makes sports exciting. So there's some kind of a, an adversarial you know, component to all things that bring joy and excitement. There's a tension that has to be there. And yet in Jannah, it seems like Allah has removed all tension. Everything is yours. Jannah al you don't have to work for them anymore. They're all yours. The food is all yours. The best kind of food is all yours. The best kind of scenery is all yours. So what's the thought process that comes? Okay, fine. Those will be exciting forever. But aren't we eventually going to get bored of the same thing over and over again? Yay, another garden. Oh, look, another waterfall. Hmm. Huh. Oh, look, more fruit. I've even had some people ask fun questions like, oh, uh, Sad, uh, Jannah talks a lot about fruits. I don't like fruit. What am I going to do? What am I going to do in Jannah? I just hate fruit. I, I mean, is there any mention of chocolate or anything? Is there like any, perhaps uh, some Swiss rolls? Any, anything else? Any bagels? Any, anything? You know, because I'm, I'm not into fruit. And then Quran describes delicious meat. Oh, Sad, I just, I hate chicken. I hate, I, hate, I hate meat. I can't stand meat. I don't know. Jannah it doesn't seem like it's relating to me, you know. It's, it didn't mention anything about strawberry ice cream. or it didn't, it didn't really talk about, you know, what about cars in Jannah? There's no mention of cars. So what, what, do we, what do we look at Jannah on the one hand, first of all, can its permanence be exciting? And if it's the same thing over and over again. On the other hand, it didn't mention the things precisely to my taste. Why, why didn't it mention things that are exact to, to my liking. And by the way, likings vary from one culture to another to another, right? But what did, what did Allah do? Allah took for, ex he, for the, the two things we have to understand here is Allah Azza wa Jal was talking first and foremost to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu who lived in a desert environment, right? And for them, the most incredible thing you can have are gardens, right? And it's not that he was only catering to the Arab audience, but you have to understand, those people work the hardest. They work the hardest for Islam. Doesn't matter what we do for Islam now, we can't compete with what those people did in their loyalty to the Prophet So what has Allah done? Allah has described in most of the occasions of Jannah, Allah has verbalized the components, the aspects of Jannah that are most enticing for the people that did the hardest work, which are the Sahaba. He did not spell out everybody's taste. An example of that, a really nice example of that is Surah Rahman. In Surah Rahman, Allah describes that there will be tents. There will be palm trees. Oh, all the fruits, He mentions, Nakhlun wa Rumman. Right? Nakhlun wa Rumman. Palm trees and pomegranate. So dates and pomegranate. Okay, with dates and pomegranate, I, I'm not a crazy fan of dates. I know that's like un-Islamic to say, but it's okay. I was hoping there would be some mention of pineapple, maybe kiwi, maybe some strawberries, oranges perhaps. But no, there's no portugal mentioned, there's no tufah mentioned, there's only nakhlun or ummanun. And I was hoping like, a, you know, a sky rise loft. I was hoping for like some kind of a mansion situation, some kind of a balcony type. No, he's mentioning tents. If you tell a Roman, like a, someone living in the Roman Empire, at that time, hey, you know what you're going to get in Jannah? In heaven, if you go to heaven, we'll get you a tent with fruits in it. Like, what? I have a castle. 
You're going to downgrade me to a tent? <laughs> you understand? But why is he mentioning tents? Because the Arab of the time, the, the Sahaba including among them, but they're not the only ones, the Arabs of that time, they found a strange joy in experiencing the desert at night in the tent. So much of their romantic poetry and their, their relationship with the sky, their relationship with the earth itself, revolves around this notion of living the tent life. In fact, it's been a millennium and a half. And some of these Arabs that are billionaires, billionaires, they have mansions, they have, they have rims that are made of gold. I don't know why they have them, but they do on their car rims. And you know what these guys do when they want a vacation, many of them? They go out to the desert and they set up an air-conditioned tent. Of all the things you could be doing, they still do that. What is it that Allah put in the Qur'an? He acknowledged As-sabiqun, As-sabiqun, al muqarrabun The first and the foremost They are the ones brought closest Because they did the greatest sacrifices In their show of loyalty to Rasulullah SAW So the narrative of Jannah Is actually first and foremost Verbalizing what they would desire But it does not exclude As a definition What you and I might desire That's the first thing to think about here the second thing to think about is gardens. Gardens are not all the same thing. The, the, the Something covered in greenery or something covered in beautiful shrubbery and things like that doesn't just mean we're just going to be dropped in the middle of a park and there's a bunch of trees and where are we going to stay? No, the most beautiful mansions anywhere in the world have remarkable landscaping. Privacy, the best kinds of privacy created in a private estate are with the, with the lining of trees and shrubbery. and The greenery brings life to the place, joy to the place. There are gardens, there are millions spent on maintaining gardens. Gardeners hired. Doesn't matter which culture you go to, if you, you know, if you, not that I'm encouraging you to watch movies, but even from times old, if you've ever seen any movie of anybody who's rich, a politician, the guy from the mafia, it doesn't matter what continent they're on, when they live the big life, what do you see? You see a mansion and you see a garden and you definitely see some kind of water feature. Either they're living next to the ocean or they've got a swimming pool to mimic the ocean or they've got some water spring to mimic a waterfall. These are the things that human beings are drawn to. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, first of all, gave us the outside experience that we are drawn to. But even then, even then, Khalidina fiha, we're in it forever. I think we'd want to eventually change something. You know, eventually, you, you, you get the perfect home. You get the home exactly the color scheme you wanted, the furniture you wanted, the layout you wanted, every last detail you picked. Three years later, you want to redesign the place. Your dream car, two years later, you want to get another one? Your favorite shirt is in the trash and you want to give it away to your brother because you don't like him that much. You want change. Allah says about this, this is, this is our nature. We want to update. We want to do new things. We want to experience new things. If you went to this most amazing vacation in some place, like, oh my God, this place was awesome. We got to go back. We got to come back here. Next time you're like, no, I've already been there. I want to go somewhere else. At the time you're like, I always want to come back here. The, the, even if you did come back, you'd be like, yeah, I think we should have gone somewhere else. I mean, you'll bring some other people who can get excited. But you're excited for them, not yourself. Because you're already, yeah, I already know. I know. I know, right? Look at that. Yeah. I see what you're feeling. I've already felt it. It's expired. <laughs> he, he, th this phrase that Allah adds here. لا يبغون عنها حولا. They are not even going to pursue or desire. They're not going to go after any kind of change from it. They're not going to want anything to change. What? How? I don't know how to process that because all I want to do when things get really permanent, no matter how good they are, I want some kind of change. If life is perfect, everything is going well, somebody says, I think I need, I need to change the scenery. I need to travel. I need to get out of here. Right? Do something else. You know? People feel unfulfilled. Boredom is actually a very... It's actually a studied psychological phenomenon. It's a studied psychological phenomenon. And it's a dissatisfaction with the reality around you at some point. It no longer gives you meaning. 
Like it's no longer fulfilling you. So you get bored and you want to do something else. So how is it that we're going to think Jannah isn't going to get bored? Actually, Suhaib, my friend Sheikh Suhaib told me about a guy who literally said, I'm a math guy. I love solving math problems. I don't think I want to go to Jannah because there won't be any math problems to solve. Bro, you're a math genius. You couldn't solve this math problem. <laughs> not, not a very good math genius. When he says, Let's dig deep, deep a little bit. First of all, in the previous ayah, Allah said, Jannatul Firdaus. And one of the positions about that is that even Firdaus, which is the highest level of Jannah, has levels, has Jannat. And you know what Allah might do perpetually into foreverness? That Allah will give you Nuzul from the first garden. And the party and the excitement is so incredible. And immediately as that excitement is going on, you're actually moved up to the next garden. And the excitement is going on. And then you moved out to the next, a new world. A completely new, unimagined. Like each Jannah unimagined from before. Not just an upgraded version of what you saw before. Something else entirely. Something you can't even bring into existence in your mind. And every single time the anticipation is renewed and renewed and renewed perpetually. But then my favorite part of this is actually what uh, others have talked about. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi mentioned really beautifully about this word nuzul. We'll come back to that because all of this is 107 and 108 are really one idea. Or initial hospitality. And then he says they will stay in that initial hospitality and they will not want any of it to change. They won't want any of it to change. What does that mean? That we are going to feel something we've never felt before. This is so perfect. What it makes me feel inside, I don't want to lose this feeling. And we're going to hold on to that feeling all the time. And when you ask somebody who's feeling the most amazing feelings, what do you want right now? You just say, I just want this to last forever. There are moments in our life where we feel this kind of joy. And if someone was to ask us, if you could have anything in the world right now, what would it be? You'd say nothing if I can just hold on to this moment forever. Now, that's all I would ask for. And that's exactly what Allah is giving. That's exactly what Allah is providing when He says, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا لَا يَبْغُونَ عَنْهَا حِوَلًا But now let's go to Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi. He says, but maybe if it is nuzul, maybe as exciting as it is, and we don't want it to go any further. We're, we're completely okay. We're, we're so happy that we got something that we've never experienced before. And it's become the anticipation, the excitement has become permanent. And yet Allah says there's even more to offer. لَهُمَّا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ and so Qafi says, they will have whatever they want in it. And we've got something more. <laughs> what, is, what is this more? Now it's the same idea, right? Initial hospitality and there's got to be something more. And look at how he describes it. This is Fakhruddin al-Razi. In his, when he comments on an ayah, he tries to break down what he sees as exploration questions. He calls them al-masail. So al-mas'alatul ula, al-thaniya, al-thalitha, al-rabi'a, like that. He categorizes them, bullet lists them, and addresses each issue within the ayah. It's a very systematic approach that he takes to his ta'amulat, to his contemplations. So this, according to him in this ayah, is al-mas'alatul rabi'a. It's the fourth issue. Okay? قَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ إِنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَعَلَ الْجَنَّةِ بِكُلِّيَتِهَا نُزُلًا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Some people have said that Allah has taken Jannah, all of it, as just the introductory gift for believers. Just the introductory hospitality. وَالْكَرِيمُ إِذَا, إذا أَعْطَى النُّزُلْ أَوَّلًا فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يُتْبِعَهُ بِالْخُلْعَةِ So when a noble, a generous person gives you initial hospitality, that means he's going to give a gap and then give you something much more. There's something much bigger coming. وَلَيْسَ بَعْدَ الْجَنَّةِ بِكُلِّيَتِهَا إِلَّا رُؤْيَةَ اللَّهِ And Jannah, after being given all of what heaven has to offer, the only thing left now that tops this is seeing Allah Himself. So above what's this is if the, and by the way if jannah the goal for us was jannah and jannah compared to seeing allah will feel like the initial hospitality just the introductory prelude just the trailer like for us right now jannah is the destination but comparing that destination to seeing my rub that destination will feel like it was just a little preview it was just nuzul فَإِنْ قَالُوا أَلَيْسَ أَنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَعَلَ فِي الْآيَةِ الْأُولَى جُمْلَةَ جَهَنَّمَ نُزُلًا لِلْكَافِرِينَ وَلَمْ يَبْقَ بَعْدَ جُمْلَةِ جَهَنَّمَ عَذَابٌ آخَرٌ So he, when he gives an, a contemplation, he looks at the, ad, the adversary's point of view. If somebody was opposing what I'm saying, it doesn't make sense. What would they say? Well, they would say that in the previous ayat, in the same surah, Allah Azza wa Jal described, إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا جَهَنَّمَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ نُزُلًا 
we we prepared jahannam as nuzul for kafirin and of course there's nothing more than jahannam for the kafirin so you how are you taking nuzul as more than that for the disbelievers and he answers this so beautifully fa kadhalika ha huna ja'ala jumlat al jannati nuzulan lil mu'minin so the same way he just says that he took took all of jannah as nuzul from mu'minin ma'a annahu laysa lahu shay akhar ba'd al jannah while knowing there's nothing after jannah you shouldn't say that oh seeing allah is beyond jannah that's not what we can extract from here well jawab so and my response would be قلنا للكافر بعد حصول جهنم مرتبة أعلى منها. Very powerful. He said above and beyond hell for the disbeliever there is something even worse. Above and beyond hell there is something even worse. وهو and what is that? كونه محجوبا عن رؤية الله. And he doesn't get to see Allah. That's worse than hell. سبحان الله. And then he describes this ayah. He says, "Kalla inna hum al Rabbihim yoma idin la mahjubun, thumma inna hum lusal al jahim." On that day, they're going to be, you know, screened, incapable of seeing their Rabb, and then they'll get jahannam too. So the bigger issue is mentioned first. What's the bigger issue? Inna hum al Rabbihim yoma idin la mahjubun, and then after that, there's on top of that, there's the second issue. which is innahum la sa thumma innahum la salul jahim faj'ala as-sala'a bin nar muta'akhkhiran fil martaba an kawnihi mahjuban an Allah subhanallah that's why he Allah mentioned them being thrown in hell as a second punishment compared to the first greater punishment that they don't even get to see Allah la yabghuna fa thumma qala ta'ala la yabghuna anha hiwala so that, then he goes on to the next point about hiwal they don't want any hiwal and he So there are two things now. First of all, there's more than Jannah, which is meeting and seeing Allah. May Allah grant all of us that. But even in that Jannah, before you even get there, just that introduction in itself is a kind of world where you don't want any change. And this is the, he, even he mentions li anna al insan fi dunya idha wasala ila ayi darajin kanat darajatin kanat fi saadat fa huwa tamih al tarf ila ma huwa agla minha. Like human beings, whenever they get anything that makes them happy. Their eye goes to something that's better. They always want an upgrade, but Allah is describing that this is an experience unlike anything we can imagine in this world. This makes us understand what the Prophet said: "Ma khatara ala qalbi bashar." Like it didn't ever. It, the heaven has never been imagined by a soul. Like nobody's ever been able to imagine what heaven is. When Allah says gardens, you're like, I can imagine a garden. Trees, I can imagine a tree. Waterfalls, I can imagine a waterfall. Fruits, I can imagine fruits. Lahmi tayrim min ma yashtahun. Flesh of birds. Barbecue chicken. I can imagine barbecue chicken was the big deal. But then, when Allah says that you will always be permanently satisfied, not wanting anything to change, that's something I can't imagine. That's something that's beyond what I what I what I can experience in this life. Subhanallah. This is the gift that Allah has given to believers. Khalidina fi halay abguna an hawala. This is now the last uh, uh, reflection on this ayah, and this has to do with the ilm al Well, within Ilm al-Ma'ani, the science of Balagha, one of its areas is a tertib, the, the sequence of things. So if you look at these prepositions, the, the, end, the end of this ayah, 108, is anha hiwalan. La yabghuna anha hiwalan. But actually, anha is muta'alliqun bi hiwal. Meaning, la yabghuna hiwalan anha. Actually. So they don't want to change from it. Change regarding it. So the anha is actually a sifa fi mahalli nasib, jar majrur sifatan fi mahalli nasib li hewal. It's a description of hewal, actually. Okay, but usually in Arabic, what's the norm? That the the adjective comes after the noun. So the normal sequence would be la yabghuna hewalan anha. But what did Allah say? La yabghuna anha hewalan. He reversed the order. Now when you reverse this order. There's actually ishara ila madunahu. It's there's an indication of something more, something other than it. So let me explain what this means. Two things. These people that are being described, the people of Jannah, they're not gonna. When it comes to it, they're not gonna want any change. What is the previous six ayat about? Seven ayat about? They're about people of hell. There's a direct contrast. They're not the. They're not the ones that are gonna want change from it. The ones who will want their situation to change forever, constantly want something to be changed, will be the people of 
Jahannam and that is the contrasting description of the people in Jahannam. يَطُوفُونَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ آن They are, on the one hand there's fire, on the one hand there is scorching water and they're going towards the fire, can't take it anymore, they run towards the water, can't take that anymore, run back towards the fire, can't take it anymore. يَطُوفُونَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ آن Meaning they constantly want what? حِوَل By contrast, the believer, when it comes to what they get, they're not going to want any hiwal. So that's one contrast. That's directly immediate in the passage. There's another dimension of this hiwal. That is, Allah is describing what the believer wants and next is going to get in the next life. They will not want any change. And this will be the ultimate contrast for the believer from what they experience in this life. In this life, actually, we are constantly pursuing change. Every one of us. And we're supposed to. I'm pursuing a change in my character. I'm pursuing a change in my refinement. If I stay the same as I am right now, that's not a good thing in my religion. I need to improve myself. I need to learn more. I need to fix my character. I need to fix my level of patience. I need to fix my, you know, the guarding of my eyes. I need to fix, you know, my ability to be more generous, to be more charitable. There's constantly change I want to make. And it's not just change inside me. I want to change things around me. I want to make things better around me. What is, what is Dhulqarnayn doing? He doesn't want the world to stay the way he, it is. He's pursuing resources to bring about more and more change. He's changing a pathway between two mountains and creating a wall. Human beings were put on this earth to bring about change and change and change and change and change. And, change. and we got to Jannah. It is actually because we were constantly pursuing a change in ourselves for the better and change in the world around us for the better. But now, finally, all that, that driver engine that was pushing us to change and transform ourselves and transform the world around us, that has now been brought to a close. That sa'i is now over. There's no more sa'i. There's no more effort to be made. There's no more transformation to, needed anymore. Now, they're not going to pursue any more change. In other words, finally, it's time to rest. Finally, it's time to relax. And even and the, the thing is, even when you relax, that can become, you know, toxic for a person, right? Like people that retire get very depressed. Because relaxation is a problem, right? And so Allah when he mentions by the end, Khalidina fi anha before it he addresses it. Unlike this world, where until my dying breath I need to be pursuing change. When, and because if I didn't, I'm doing something short of what I'm created for. And there's a dis dissatisfaction inside me that I'm not pursuing change. In the next life, Allah will take this desire from inside me away. And even when it's taken away, it will not lead to dissatisfaction or depression or boredom. All of that has been removed. SubhanAllah. A direct contrast between this life and the next. So Jannah isn't just, you know, these insights are important because Allah isn't just contrasting Jannah you know, a temporary life versus a permanent life. And there's no other qualitative dis differences between the two. Or we have food here, but we have much better food there. We have home here, we have much better home there. And it's not just that. There's something more that's actually fundamentally different. We become fundamentally different. We become the perfect version of ourselves where we're not pursuing constant change. Subhanallah. It's not, it's, it isn't just Jannah that's been upgraded. I have been upgraded. You have been upgraded. And that's Allah's reward to us. And in a sense, it's almost as if I'm reminded of the ayat of Surah Al-Najm where Allah says, وَأَن لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ سَعِيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى ثُمَّ يُجْزَاهُ الْجَزَاءَ الْأَوْفَى وَأَنَّ إِلَى رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَى So, a, that, those ayat, some remarkable ayat about effort, right? A human being owns nothing except their efforts. And their efforts shall be seen, right? And then they shall be given the most complete reward for their efforts. Then he says, and to your master finally is the ultimate end. Also end of what? End of struggles. End of constant struggle. So it's not just the end as in there's nothing more, but also something inside you that used to be there constantly has now been brought to an end and Allah has completely removed that from you and yet given you internal bliss and joy. May Allah Azza wa grant all of us His Jannah. May Allah Azza wa overlook our mistakes and grant us the highest levels of Jannah and forgive and short, uh, you know, overlook all of the sins and mistakes and errors that we've made along the way. Do you ever get worried that your child may click on the wrong video online? 
Do you wish there was a safe channel for your peace of mind? Well, there is. The number one rated Muslim kids channel in the world, One for Kids TV, is here to solve all these issues. The channel has no advertisements and is safe for your children to browse and watch their favorite videos. With a wide selection of cartoons, songs, educational videos, and much more, your children will not only stay entertained, but also learn so much about their deen. You can listen to songs while your device is switched off and you can download videos to watch them offline. One for Kids TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means the small amount you pay for your subscription is a continuous charity for you, as all the funds raised go towards the production of new cartoons and educational films for your children. The One for Kids TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku, so you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 14-day trial.